Hello, Victoria Symphony followers. My name is Bob Fraser. I'm one of the musicians of the Victoria Symphony. I'm the orchestra's bass trombonist. This video is uh, an introduction to the music on our upcoming Masterworks concert, which is this Sunday, November the 10th, at the Farquhar Auditorium at the University of Victoria at 2.30 p.m. Now, many of you know I give pre-concert lectures one hour prior to each uh, of our Masterworks and Classics concerts. When we do these at UVic, uh, we do them in the Senate Chambers, uh, which is a large room in the administration building right next to the UVic Center. Uh, unfortunately, we've moved a number of extra programs to UVic this season and we're running into scheduling problems. And for a number of our concerts, the Senate chambers aren't available. Uh, we're working on a solution for future seasons, but in the meantime, we're trying this. I'm making this video, which will be in place of the pre-concert talk. Uh, there'll be no live pre-concert talk on Sunday. And hopefully, this video will serve a dual purpose. Uh, if we can get this online and enough of you see it before Sunday, it might persuade some of you who weren't planning on coming to go out and buy a ticket for this because it's going to be a fabulous concert. So those of you watching this on social media, please feel free to share it wildly, share it with impunity. So here we are in my studio. Uh, this is in the basement of my house. So I'm going to give you the pre-concert talk right here. Um, the nice thing about this is I can wear what I like. Um, I can hear my colleagues' eyes rolling because this is my usual work ensemble, uh, what I'm wearing right now. Uh, and unlike my usual pre-concert talk, I'm in no hurry to go out and perform a concert immediately after this. Um, in fact, at the time that I'm recording this, I'm more concerned about um, to first rehearsal for this concert, which is tomorrow morning. Today is Wednesday. I'm being ably assisted by my wonderful videographer behind the camera, Spencer Pickles. Uh, he's being very kind. He's keeping this shot quite narrow, so you can't see where I have pushed all of the mess in my studio out of the way of the shot. There's sheet music, books, papers, music stands, mutes. Well, there's a couple of mutes back there. For those of you who aren't familiar with my pre-concert talks, they're usually 30 minutes long, and I don't do a detailed analysis of each piece. That would be not only impossible, but even if it were possible, it would be too much information to retain going into the hall afterwards. So what I try to do is give a basic introduction to each work, and sometimes I don't even cover every work on the program. And I'll give you one or two things to take into the concert hall with you that you can listen for or watch for. So this video will likely be a little less than 30 minutes. And because you're watching this on that wonderful 50-year-old phenomenon known as the internet, we can put some links to other material that will hopefully inspire you. Uh, there, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of these links. So, so I figure since you're on the web watching this, I might as well uh, send you down a rabbit hole. Now I'll get Spencer to put up my email address. Uh, vspreconcert at gmail.com. We'll put it along somewhere along the screen here uh, periodically. And feel free to email me at any time if you have any questions. If there's something you've always wanted to ask a symphony musician, here's your chance. Uh, so here we go. I've never believed that art music of any, any genre is a black box. And that's a term engineers use to describe something that that works, but you have no idea how, and it's ridiculously complex on the inside. Not so. Uh, even the most bafflingly complicated sounding music is really generated from very simple and very basic materials. So the first work on this program is a, a really delightful set of folk music arrangements. It's called the Nordic Suite. It's the perfect opener to this program because this whole program is devoted to Nordic composers. Our concerto is written by a Danish composer, uh, Paul Ruders. And of course, the big work on the second half is the Fifth Symphony of Jean Sibelius, the famous Finnish composer. 
Uh, and of course, our music director, our beloved music director, Christian Kluxen himself is Danish. So this is a natural fit uh, for us having a program like this. Now, this opening Nordic suite is based on arrangements of various uh, folk tunes from various parts of Scandinavia, mostly Denmark, and it's by uh, a group called the Danish String Quartet. And it's been arranged uh, specifically for us for a large string ensemble. They've actually even added a, a solo oboe into one of the movements. Um, and the uh, Christian asked the quartet's first violinist, he's a fellow named Runa Sorensen, to adapt these for a large uh, string section. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're the first audience to hear these, and they're, they're quite exquisite. If you go to YouTube, and we'll put a link um, somewhere on this video, probably in our YouTube uh, channel, so it'll be in the About section, uh, just right underneath the uh, title for this video. Uh, if you go to YouTube, the Danish String Quartet has uh, a number of videos, and there's one called Woodworks. It's two words, Woodworks. And the very first section of this piece, Woodworks, is essentially the first movement of the Nordic Suite. There's no real need to go into a lot of detail about this work. It's one of those pieces that I know you're going to immediately just enjoy. Uh, it's music meant for gatherings of people. It's for weddings. Uh, the first movement is a set of wedding music from the Faroe Islands. Uh, for dancing, a number of the other movements are dance movements. Uh, there's a hymn in there called Now is Found the Fairest of Roses. And because the Scandinavian peoples have a strong connection to the British Isles, you'll hear a lot of forms in this music that resemble uh, the folk music that you hear from the British Isles as well. Since it's on that YouTube video, I'm going to point up a little bit of the first movement of this piece. These are songs from the Faroe Islands. Now, if you're a regular Victoria Symphony concert goer and you have a prodigious memory, you'll remember that two years ago, this in fact it was November 2017, we performed a piece by Carl Nielsen. Uh, who's Denmark's most celebrated composer, and it was called An Imaginary Journey to the Faroe Islands. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Faroe Islands is a small archipelago of 18 islands north of Scotland. Uh, it's more or less halfway between the uh, west coast of Norway on one side and Iceland on the other. Very isolated and extremely beautiful. I confess I knew absolutely nothing about the Faroe Islands before we did that piece, so I looked them up. Do a Google image search of Faroe Islands, F-A-R-O-E, and watch your jaw drop. It, it is truly a magical place, and I desperately want to go there. Um, since this is a piece of folk music, this would be a good opportunity to tell you about modes, and we, um, I can tie this into the Sibelius as well when I talk about the Sibelius. This is my quick elevator pitch on modal music. If I were riding on an elevator with you and I had to explain what modes are before the elevator stopped, uh, this is what I would do. Um, pretty much every culture in the world has discovered this. This is an octave. This note here, I'll play this here. This is, I'll play it on these two notes. Pretty well, every culture in the world has discovered that. If you play this note, which is an A, by the way, and this note here is also an A, we give those two pitches the same name, even though they are different frequencies, but they sound similar. The reason for that is mathematics, of course. This one's half the frequency of this one. Uh, now, uh, it, the next most common interval, and pretty well every culture in the world has discovered that if you triple the frequency of this, you get this note. And if I move that there, I get this. Okay, so this is a fifth, this is an octave. Now, all you smart apples um, are going to complain that this isn't exactly three times the frequency of this. Uh, this is 220 cycles. 
this should be 660, but it's not. It's actually 659.2 hertz, according to my tuner. I only mention this for the sake of the pedants out there who might want to point this out. Um, I could easily explain why this is, but it opens a huge, huge can of worms that I don't want to deal with. Besides, the elevator stopped and I have to get off. So, as I said, pretty much every culture has figured this out. And that's where the similarities end, because pretty well every culture has found a different way to fill in the gaps between all of these notes. There's a million different ways, and some of them involve more than the 12 notes that we use in our tradition. Now, the ways of filling in these gaps are called modes. We sometimes call them scales. And our musical tradition, including all, all of our pop music, is dominated by two of these. Okay, one of them is called, a, we call them a major scale and a minor scale. This is a major scale, this is a minor scale, of course. Right? Now, there are quite a number of these um, modes, and as I said, our, a lot of our music is dominated by two of them. The thing about folk music is that it uses a lot of different ones. Um, for example, uh, if you take a major scale, and you just change one single note, That makes it a gigantic difference uh, as to how you can use those notes to create both a melody and how the harmonic uh, component of, of that melody will, will manifest itself because our harmony is all based on combining the notes within those modes to make chords. Right? So that you would think there's not that much difference between that and that one lowered seventh, but it makes a huge difference. Um, another mode is uh, called the, uh, the Dorian mode. And uh, just to give you an idea of what that sounds like. Now it's very, very close to a minor scale. There's only one note that's different between those two, but that note makes a huge amount of difference. For example, the very popular song, Green Sleeves, um, and I guess it's close enough to Christmas time that we can call it What Child Is This, as much as I'm trying to avoid Christmas music because it's still only November, but um, a lot of the times Green Sleeves is played in either one of those modes, and it makes a huge difference which one you choose. If you play that in the Dorian mode, which I think is really the proper mode for that, but there's no, there's no consensus as to which mode that's supposed to be. If you play green sleeves in the Dorian mode, it sounds like this. I'll play that again. So this is the Aeolian mode. This is the other mode, the minor mode. And in the Dorian mode, so it has a completely different character. The first, one of the first songs in this Nordic suite that we're going to perform is in the Dorian mode. And it's, uh, it's a fairies uh, from the Faroe Islands. It's a wedding song from the Faroe Islands. And it sounds like this. thing that gives that mode its character is that is that lowered seventh note all right so they, that, that's what gives that note uh, that sixth and that seventh note give that 
mode its its character. Now, normally in folk music, the harmony would be very simple. So you would expect something like this to have a very simple uh, treatment. What um, Sorensen has done, he's given it an extremely lush um, harmonization. Now I'm reading this off a string quartet score, so you'll have to forgive me because I'm a trombone player and I'm not used to reading four staffs and three clefs all at the same time. But what he does with the violins is that he harmonizes this in fourths, which give it an even uh, more mysterious character. So he does this. So, and in addition to that, he puts all of the lower strings underneath that in a, in a big cluster of chords. So we actually have... Like that. So it has a very mysterious uh, quality to it. Um, this uh, particular uh, uh, suite has quite a number of different uh, styles that you'll hear. There's a lot of dance uh, movements, reels, jigs, and it's it's really quite delightful. Um, it's really quite a delightful setting of these these songs. And what I would suggest you do, if uh, we'll put again, we'll put another link, is the Danish String Quartet uh, the performances of these. Check check them out, especially the uh, the first movement, because the first movement is very very similar to what. Uh, you'll hear on the Victoria Symphony program. So we'll put those in the video description on the YouTube channel, so, so check them out. The second piece, the second piece on the program, it's a brand new concerto that was co-commissioned. Uh, what usually happens in our business is uh, a work is commissioned one by one person or one organization will ask a composer to write something. And in this case, it's a joint commission, so we're sharing this commission uh, with the Danish National Symphony Orchestra, which is a, a, a great, uh, wonderful cross-cultural thing for us to do. They premiered the concerto in April um, with the same, uh, same soloist, Bjarke uh, Mogensen, whom it was written for, and we get the second performance of it, and you'll be the very first North American audience to hear this piece. It's called Sound and Simplicity, Seven Pillars of Music for Accordion and Symphony Orchestra. And I'll just read you a little bit of what uh, uh, Paul Ruders, the composer, has written about this. He's written, all music is sound, but not all music is simple. Simplicity is a virtue, especially in the arts, a fact which becomes increasingly and inescapably obvious to me the older I get. In sound and simplicity, four out of the seven movements are very simple, as in the absence of any structural and metric complexity. Indeed, in fact, the second movement, which is entitled trance, is a sustained chord, and it employs only four notes but gradually presented over three octaves. And I'll play you. Those are the four notes um, in the trance movement. And you'll actually hear those uh, first stated by the accordion. The wonderful thing about an accordion is that it can literally sustain a note forever because the, the bellows work both ways on an accordion. It's a little bit like the bow on a stringed instrument. If you can... Um, uh, if you have mastered the technique of changing the bow direction and keeping the note going without there being any break in the sound. It's very similar to what you can do in the accordion. And what he's in fact done is he's, he's put those four notes in a number of families in the orchestra and he has different instruments trade off the notes. So at one point the first violins might be playing that note and the second violins might be playing that note. And in the middle of 
uh, of the passage, he'll have them switch, switch parts. So you still, from the audience, you still hear that. But the texture slightly changes as the sound of one of those notes moves from one section to the other. So it's a, it's a really fantastic, and like he said, a very simplistic uh, effect. Uh, what else does he write about this? Well, um, Ruders writes, um, only two of the seven titles are related to given literary text. The first movement's called Rain, and it's a musical reflection on a couple of lines from the Danish writer uh, Arthur Kraslinkoff, and the novel's called From the Eye of the, the, Eye of the Whale. Uh, and here's a translation of what, uh, what he's written. But best of all were the sounds from the drops, all the myriad sounds with which a drop could touch a leaf, a twig, a stone, gravel, the cement on the stairs, the clothesline, the roof, as if the rain was playing a single incredible instrument. And the treatment that Reuters has in the score for this piece is he has all of these various, various types of these, these clusters in, in each part of the orchestra and, and how they all are articulated and, and treated uh, gives a really wonderful musical depiction of rain hitting all of these various surfaces and all the different kinds of sound that that kind of uh, percussive, uh, repetitive articulation can make. Uh, so otherwise, he says, the listener is completely free to contemplate what I could possibly be hiding behind the titles of Trance, Haiku, Song Link, Twilight, and Wolf Moon. Those are the names of uh, five uh, the other five movements. Uh, the title, of course, uh, comes, he said it's a hybrid of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility and T.E. Lawrence, as in Lawrence of Arabia's Seven Pillars of Wisdom. But he said, but it's only, it's just his little mashup of those titles. N a nod and a bow for me, he said. Now, uh, Ruders has written a number of works for accordion. This is his third sort of major work. Um, for the instrument. There's another one called Serenade on the Shores of the Cosmic Ocean, which he wrote for accordion and string quartet. And we're going to link that as well in this video, um, uh, a recording of one of the movements of Shores on the Cosmic Ocean. It'll give you a really good idea of Reuter's uh, compositional style. Uh, what can I say about the accordion? It is a much maligned instrument. Uh, I would say, I would say that the four instruments that bear the brunt of the most jokes among musicians and non-musicians alike, uh, in no particular order, the accordion, the banjo, the bagpipes, the viola. All right, I would probably guess that trombone and maybe bass or drums aren't terribly far behind in that. Uh, in that order. But the accordion is, is a really, uh, I think, a completely underrated instrument, especially the type of instrument that uh, our soloist plays, uh, Bjarke Mogensen. Uh, and we will link to one of his videos as well, because uh, you really should have a chance to, to hear what he sounds like. Paul Reuters, by the way, is a composer of international reputation. Uh, he just had his opera, The Thirteenth Child, premiered at the Santa Fe Opera. Uh, he wrote a major opera based on Margaret Atwood's uh, novel, A Handmaid's Tale, that's been produced on two continents. Um, he's done a great video also where he talks about his approach to music, and again, we're going to link that. You're going to have about six or seven links to look through by the time you get through this video. Sibelius's Fifth Symphony. Uh, is the major work on the program. We've played a lot of Sibelius uh, in this orchestra, but surprisingly enough, we have not done the Fifth Symphony that often. This is only the fourth time that the orchestra has ever performed it. And the last time, and I looked this up, the last time was 25 years ago. Uh, so it's uh, 25 years ago this month, in fact. So it's been quite a long time. We do the Second Symphony a lot. It's one of his bigger, much more romantic uh, symphonies. The fifth is a little bit different. Um, 
I've chosen in talking about this to take my words directly from Sibelius himself because he wrote a number of diary entries in 1915 when he was working on this symphony that give a lot of insight into how he approached the piece. Uh, what he said uh, early on in, uh, in uh, October, this is our, from October of 1914. He says, the autumn sun is shining, nature in its farewell colors. My heart is singing sadly, the shadows grow longer. And then he writes with a question mark, the adagio of my fifth symphony, that I, poor fellow that I am, can have moments of such richness. So he wrote that on the 10th of October, 1914, in his diary. And it's really appropriate that we're doing this uh, in November, because it's really um, the perfect setting for autumn, I think. Another diary, diary entry that he wrote in April of the following year, and this, I love this quote because he says, in the evening I was working on the symphony, this important task which strangely enchants me, as if God the Father had thrown down pieces of a mosaic from the floor of heaven and asked me to work out the pattern. Um, one of the things that you need to know about Sibelius is that he was a real lover of nature. He was a real lover of the outdoors. And you hear that in all of his music. Um, just a few weeks after he wrote that, he, he wrote on the 21st of April that he saw 16 swans. I guess he took it upon himself to count them exactly. There were exactly 16. In his diary, he immediately wrote a magnificent thematic sequence, which ended up in the finale of the Fifth Symphony. And he said it was inspired by the sound that the swans made. And he describes it as one of the great experiences of my life. God, how beautiful, he wrote in his diary. And that is the big horn theme in the final movement of the symphony. So you'll hear that uh, uh, very obviously in the last movement. One of the neat things about that theme uh, is if you play it backwards, it's a palindrome. It actually uh, mirrors, uh, mirrors itself one way or the other. There's a lot of that in Sibelius's music. He writes a lot of, uh, of uh, elements that pivot back and forth between, um, between chords, like that theme that I played. And it automatically returns to that one chord, and then it swings to a lower chord, and then swings to a lower chord, and then swings back. And uh, I have found a, a fantastic video by a composer named David Bruce. Um, he's somebody that I've been following on YouTube for a long time. He um, does all kinds of wonderful little compositional projects where he takes a, a group of themes and he sends them out to five different composers and he has them all write their take on those themes for the same group of, of musicians and then he performs it all and uh, you can see uh, five different composers views of the same thing. He does all these wonderful things on his YouTube channel but he's also made a number of videos for the London Symphony Orchestra and he made a terrific video about Sibelius's Fifth Symphony where he describes uh, that pattern that I just uh, played for you. Um, and he describes the sort of spiral um, spinning compositional technique that Sibelius uses. It's, uh, and again, we'll link that so you'll have something else to, uh, to watch. I was talking about modes earlier, so I want to talk a little bit about them again. Um, and how, how chords basically work around modes. Uh, major scale. Major scale is one type of mode, and it dominates, like I said, it dominates a lot of our music. Remember I told you that every culture had discovered this. This, this particular interval, if you build chords on the, the, the first note and the fifth note of a scale, you get the two most common chords in all of 
our musical tradition. Like basically every every song gravitates around a chord on the dominant and a chord on the tonic, like that. And I talk about this all the time ad nauseum in my pre-concert talks that I do live. So if you've been to those, you hear me talk a lot about the gravitational pull between five and one. And uh, it happens to just be the way that those, those chords lead to each other that does that. The opening movement of Sibelius's Fifth Symphony, the very first thing you hear is the horn playing this, this um, uh, melody here. It's a very horn type melody because it has it has those uh, those common intervals the fifth and a fifth turned upside down is basically a fourth so it, it does it has those very elemental parts to it now if you were harmonizing that using sort of the traditional chords that you would put under that in the key of E flat major, you would probably harmonize it like this. You would probably do that because you're going from the tonic, the first note of E flat major, to the to the fifth, to the dominant, like that. So that melody logically Would logically be done like that. Now, Sibelius doesn't do that, of course. Of course he doesn't do that. How does he do it? He starts, first of all, he's got four horns playing this, so he has he has two of them playing, just two of the notes in the chord, and they're not playing anything else. That's all you hear, is those two horns playing that. And then the other two horns come in with... Right? So they don't go to the expected chord. And in fact, to make it even more um, ethereal sounding, what he does is he puts the, the timpani underneath it, and he puts exactly the opposite of what you would expect the chords to be. In E-flat major, you would expect a timpani player to be playing. But what does he do? He actually does that in reverse. So he actually starts the timpani here with those two horns and then the other two horns. Right? So that's the chord he ends up on like that. And it's a very open chord. There isn't a lot of thickness to that chord. Like, right? There aren't six or seven notes in it. It's basically just those three notes and they're spaced in such a way that uh, they don't they don't want to take you anywhere this is a very very open open sounding uh, landscape that he's setting you can imagine Sibelius looking out over a very vast empty plain or a, a very uh, uniform looking forest nothing but sky in front of him because remember he's talking about God basically handing this stuff down to him from the heavens so this is this is what he hears and then the first thing that you hear after that opening statement is is basically the woodwinds and again they're playing this very open open sound there's a fifth there but there's no notes in between to form a chord like he's not doing that which is an obvious chord he's just doing this and then the next statement that they make right which also has a very open sonority so this is how he he creates these very uh, uh, open patterns throughout the first movement of this piece. And then as, as the uh, movement unfolds, uh, he takes you in a completely, completely different direction. But that's just some of Sibelius's vocabulary. The thing about Sibelius that uh, 
that always hits me as a musician is that whenever, uh, you know, whenever I'm listening to uh, music, if something by Sibelius comes on, I can almost immediately recognize it. It's not similar to any, it's similar to a lot of different type of music, but it's unique the way he uses that kind of, that kind of vocabulary. So that's about all I'm going to say about the, uh, the Sibelius Fifth Symphony. Of course, because you're on the internet right now, you can probably find about a million recordings of this on YouTube to, to find. Just listen to that opening statement uh, once again, and you, you can hear exactly what he's done with that. So I'm going to leave you to your homework now. You've got all of these links in the descriptions below. You have my email address. Hopefully we'll put that up here as well so that you, if you have any questions, you can ask them of me. We're going to do this again for the concert um, on November the 17th because, again, we can't get the... Um, uh, we can't get the facility at UVic, so I'll be doing another one of these videos to talk about that concert as well. So I really hope that this has inspired you to go and look up uh, all of this stuff about this music, and I hope that it's inspired you to go out and buy a ticket if you haven't got one already. If you do have a ticket, you're in for a treat, and I will see you there uh, on Sunday. I'll be looking for you from my spot in the trombone section. So big thank you to Spencer for uh, setting up in my basement and, and doing all this work and doing the editing on this as well as the Victoria Symphony for uh, providing the space for all this. So thanks very much and I'll see you at the concert on Sunday. <laughs>